Hi, Erin. I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Hi. Yes. Good morning. I can see you and I can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the clerk, just a courtesy announcement that we are now live on the internet, YouTube, and our meeting portal. Hi, Marty. I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? I believe you're muted. And is that better? Oh, there you are. I see you and I hear you. Thank you. And Akila, I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? And Vice Chairperson Lee, I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Good morning. I can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Chairperson Smitty, and I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Hi, this is Joe Smitty, and are we loud and clear? We are loud and clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Douglas Press, I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Is there anyone I've missed for a microphone test? If not, I will conclude testing. Thank you very much. All right, Tom, just making a sound check. Hi, Tom. Uh, I heard you, but I think you had some echo in the room. Is there a separate oh. microphone in there as well? How's it now? Oh, there we go. Sounds good. Thank enough? you. Yes. Great. Thank you. Welcome, Tom. Nice to see you. Hey, great to great to see you as well, Joe, Otto, uh, Danielle, and everybody. Thank you.
Recording in progress. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. This is County Supervisor Joe Simidian, and this is our Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force. Uh, why don't we go ahead and begin by asking uh, on item number one, as we always do, for the roll call uh, to establish the presence of a quorum and also to call the meeting to order. So let me turn to the clerk and say, please call the roll. Good morning, Vice Chairperson Lee. Good morning, Lee present. And Chairperson Simidian. Present as well. Thank you very much. All right. We have established the presence of a quorum. That takes us to item number uh, two, which is our public, uh, excuse me, our public comment. Let me check with the clerk, see if we have anyone who has queued up to speak under public comment. We have one request to speak, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, let's go ahead and hear from that speaker. And as you know, we will allow up to three minutes and uh, we can accept no more than one or two folks, let's say uh, no more than two more folks if they come late to the queue, please. All right. Sounds good. Our first speaker is Blair Beekman. I'm unmuting you. You'll have three minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Blair. Hi, here. <laughs> I made it. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, hopefully my uh, initial public comment won't be too long today. I'm practicing the idea that, uh, you know, thank you for your patience that you allow myself public comment. I'd like to be able to speak on, on many items as possible. Um, to be clear on that concept, hopefully it can be of help to yourselves and the process. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank you for the meeting today. It's nice to be attending uh, this sort of meeting. I wanted to thank yourselves that uh, in what seems will be a uh, what is really turning out to be a long term war in the Ukraine area that uh, you are continuing the sister city program in uh, Santa Clara County with Moscow at this time. Uh, it, I think, can offer a lot of help uh, just to the process of humanity. And, and what can be good practices? What can, what can we share as good ideas between ourselves while they're fighting uh, at the national level? Uh, it, I, I just think it's a tremendous thing that you guys have allowed the process to continue. And I can't thank you enough for doing that. I have the deep fears that this winter, uh, things are gonna grow kind of cold and um, cold in ideas and cold in, in how we'll be living. And I'm afraid those ideas, uh, how difficult it will be in that in that area, will start to really affect policies in this country. And we are trying hard not to do that, but I still think that that, that concept is there. So a real good luck. I, I think this is the right appropriate sort of meeting to mention these concepts. Uh, a real good luck to ourselves, how we address to, to continue the practices of peace that really draws out our better selves, our better human values and ideals, our better practices of democracy, basically. And we don't lie to each other as much. We don't do things in secret. We're open and caring and sharing with each other. And when war takes place, we close down and we stop doing those good things. Uh, so it's real important that uh, good luck to ourselves, how we can practice those good skills uh, this upcoming winter. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Let me check with the clerk. Speak. That concludes our request to speak, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Excuse the crosstalk there. All right, uh, then uh, without uh, additional public comment, we are teed up to move on to item number three, which is to approve the consent calendar and changes to our task force agenda. Supervisor Lee, may I look to you for a motion to approve the consent calendar, which is modest today? So moved. And I will second. Uh, let me see if we have anyone who wishes to speak on those two items under consent calendar. Uh, Madam Clerk. We do have a request to speak, Mr. Chair. And the only thing I would say to the uh, queued up speaker, whoever he or she may be, is the only two items on the consent calendar which would be appropriate for comment are the approval of our minutes and the um, continuing need to uh, use remote meetings in accordance with government code section 54953E. So let me ask the speaker who is teed up if uh, his or her comments are not directed to those two items to forego comment. Now, with all of that, 
Let's see if we still have somebody queued up to speak on item number three. We do? We do, sir. All right, two minutes, please. Thank you, yes. Blair Beekman. You have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I wanted to speak on uh, the item. I can't, I don't know its number. It's number eight uh, in, in continuing the remote uh, meeting process uh, at this time. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to thank yourselves that you're uh, continuing the hybrid meeting process and that you had a board of supervisors meeting yesterday that's talking about uh, the future of uh, COVID issues and, and flu this fall. Um, we're going to have uh, an uprise in, in cases again. It may not be as strong as the previous years, but enough that uh, we should be considering it. I think you had a good conversation yesterday that makes the continuation of the hybrid meeting process important. And it is from that, I wanted to offer an important reminder that uh, there, there's technology questions uh, and data collection questions involved with, with these continual meetings and this process that I hope you're uh, wanting to make readily available to the public as part of the public process. Um, to do that is uh, working towards our better practices of what can be open public policies and accountability with technology that we just desperately need at this time. It's those good practices that I mentioned yesterday, along with things like uh, the future of biometric technology practices. We have policies that allow us to make that an open conversation again. And we should take full advantage of that and trust that and, and not be afraid to have open conversations uh, about uh, this sort of subject matter. And uh, it's the open public policies with tech that's allowing us those things at this time and a good luck in, in continuing those good practices and why uh, how we continue to have these uh, public meetings, uh, hybrid meetings. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much. Let me ask the clerk if we have anyone else who is in the queue to speak under public uh, comment for uh, the consent calendar. That concludes public comment, Mr. Chair. All right, then we'll ask you to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. And the consent calendar is approved unanimously. Thanks very much. All right, into our regular agenda. That takes us to item number four, which is uh, oral reports from either the chair or the vice chair relating to items of interest to the task force. Uh, Supervisor Lee, anything you'd like to share? Supervisor Lee, if you are speaking yeah, sorry here, about we... that. Yeah, I just have a little problem uh, trying to unmute myself here. And no, I was, don't we all? I was talking to myself for a second. And I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> thank you. No, um, I don't really have any necessary new um, <clears throat> comments other than the fact that there are some uh, interesting update uh, uh, relating to federal affairs. Uh, the DACA uh, issue certainly is now at the um, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. I think that could affect a lot of folks. There is uh, legislation that was unveiled by uh, Representative uh, Ruben Gallego on this issue uh, uh, regarding DACA recipient and joining the military uh, for path of citizenship. Uh, and also uh, Senator Padilla uh, introducing uh, legislation to expand the pathway to permanency of many long-term US residents as well. Uh, so a lot of very exciting uh, legislation coming in that area. Just want to uh, bring it up for our uh, group to, to, to monitor for the future. Um, and uh, certainly the, the governor has signed many bills. I know it's not the federal affairs necessarily, but issues that is uh, relating to a lot of uh, issues relating to green climate package and whatnot. So uh, I just want to leave it at that for now. Um, thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee. I will just um, indicate I have spent some time and attention in uh, recent weeks and months uh, on uh, the privacy debate that is taking place in Washington, D.C., uh, been in touch with uh, both uh, folks uh, who have served in the state legislature who have dealt with these privacy issues over the years, as well as, well as with uh, our own uh, local congressional delegation, have been following the issue closely. I am basically tipping my hand here a little bit that when we get to uh, item number six, uh, I will want to engage our advocates at Prime uh, to talk a little bit about this. I am not expecting a report on this today, so they need not be anxious about that. But if they have anything they can share, uh, I will ask, and I will also be asking for um, 
a more structured conversation about this at our next meeting of the task force. But uh, the one thing I wanted to share today was just that this has been an area where I've been uh, a little bit engaged over the last couple of months because um, California has a, a, I would say, if not a unique role, a special place certainly in the conversation. All right, then uh, I don't think there's anything else in the way of uh, oral reports, verbal reports from the chair or the vice chair. Let me just check with the uh, clerk and see if we have anyone who is in the queue to speak on this item. No request to speak. Then uh, it's simply a motion to receive the report, Supervisor Lee. So moved. Second by Semidian. Clerk, please call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Semidian. Aye. That is received. All right. Uh, on to um, the next item, which is item number five, which is to receive the report from the Office of the County Council. And uh, I am looking at the screen. And Mr. Press, do we look to you, as we so often do, to tell us what uh, is uh, news of note for our county on the legal scene? Yes, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chairperson Smitty and Vice Chairperson Lee. Um, just wanted to um, give sort of an update on where we are uh, on the regulatory front, um, a theme that we've been talking about for some time now is that um, if you really boil down uh, the chart that um, the County Council's office provides in support of these meetings, um, most of the uh, legal action pertains to regulations um, uh, for a variety of reasons that we've discussed before, um, but also for the fact that uh, a lot of these regulatory lawsuits take a great deal of time and a lot of the regulatory action takes a great deal of time. So I just wanna open with something, um, a few things that have happened, um, just a, well, a couple of reminders since our last uh, um, uh, meeting, but also a couple of new developments. And let me just go on video briefly. I know I don't usually go on video, but here I am, hello everyone. Uh, let's see if I can, get this in front of me. This I just want to highlight this particular document that I'm having a hard time. Let me go. Let's see if I can. There it is. Okay. Maybe you can see it. There it is. Okay. This document here, um, this is uh, published by the California Health and Human Services Agency, um, which incidentally was my last appointed position before I came to the county. Um, this is a really helpful guide. Um, it's called the Public Charge Guide. It's very short. It's available for anyone who wants to go to the California Health and Human Services Agency website. And I just found it to be, um, we've checked it out. We think it's accurate. Um, it's just very helpful, very short summary for a lot of folks. If you just want a quick rundown of what the new public charge rule means. So first bit of news is we have a new final rule uh, on the public charge rule. And just to give some of the listening audience a little bit more of a background, um, you may recall that, or, or not, uh, if you don't know the history, but that for decades, public charge was this notion, um, sort of an ancient notion of we didn't want to have uh, immigrants coming to the country that in theory would become a public charge, i.e. meaning dependent upon cash-based benefits. That was sort of the formulation for, for decades. The Trump administration uh, changed that dramatically and basically made a whole wide variety of public benefits, non-cash-based benefits, health-based benefits, food benefits, all sorts of other very traditional and supportive public benefits, suddenly that was going to be counted, as well as benefits not just received by an applicant for adjustment of status or entry to the US, but also by an applicant's family member. So it was just a really radical change. This board authorized the first lawsuit in the nation back in 2019 to ch challenge that new public charge rule um, like many things that we have led over the years, it uh, also inspired a number of other lawsuits that were filed around the, the nation uh, against the public charge rule. And 
uh, long story short, while we secured, I think it was at least among the first preliminary injunctions against the rule, um, that was an injunction that was uh, uh, geographically limited to mostly Western states, um, but that ultimately this large nationwide effort to block the public charge rule was successful. And so the public charge rule was ultimately enjoined nationwide and then actually vacated or what they call a vacatur. But then that sort of leaves the question is, well, without the public charge rule, uh, what happens next? Um, and so the federal, uh, uh, the new uh, Biden administration embarked upon, upon uh, what we call uh, rulemaking. And they uh, went through the usual process of notice and comment. We submitted comments. And what's interesting is that uh, not only was our litigation successful, it looks like our public comment efforts were also successful in that um, we were definitely heard in terms of the, the shape of the final rule. So the final rule um, for the public charge rule um, was, was published on September 9th, and it goes into effect on December 23rd. Um, usually there's... Um, a few months gap between the uh, publication of a final rule and its effective date, so no different here. If you're wondering what's gonna happen in the interim, um, the US Citizen and Immigration Services announces on their website that in the interim, until the effective date of the final rule, that they will, quote, continue to apply the public charge ground of inadmissibility consistent with the 1999 interim field guidance. Translation, they're going to go back to the way things used to be. <laughs> and that's what they're going to do until this new public charge rule takes effect on December 23rd of this year. So very briefly, just want to walk through um, if you if you don't mind, just want to walk through some of the differences and changes that are occurring through this new Biden era rule that changes the Trump era rule. That's basically uh, breaks down onto what is and is not prohibited and who is is and is not prohibited. So on the what side of things, so the this new public charge rule is returning to the longstanding, more traditional approach of focusing only on cash-based benefits. So now the new public charge analysis will look at um, a only a recipient, not the recipient's family members, but only the recipient's use of, or potential use of supplemental security income, SSI, temporary assistance for needy families, um, which is the successor program to AFDC, state, tribal, territorial, or local government cash-based benefits programs, such as general assistance, and then sort of a very small category of long-term institutional care uh, at government expense. Typically, these are, these are in skilled nursing facilities. These are a very, very small number of people. I mean, it's really more of a footnote, but just, but that's what they're gonna be looking at, which is a much smaller, uh, population of public benefits um, than what the Trump rule was looking at. So now what is not considered public benefit wise, what is not considered um, countable, if you will, from a public charge analysis, healthcare, food, and many other non-cash benefits. So this is, I would say, great news. So for example, CalFresh or SNAP benefits, formerly known as food stamps, not counted. Uh, school meals, not counted. Medi-Cal benefits. And again, for folks as listening audiences benefit, Medi-Cal is the California implementation of the national Medicaid program. Um, so that doesn't count. Medicare benefits doesn't count. Covered California premium sub subsidies doesn't count. For COVID and other uh, communicable diseases, immunize, immunization and testing for communicable diseases does not count. In-home supportive services, IHSS, doesn't count. Section 8, WIC, uh, Women and Infants with Children's Benefits, doesn't count. Disaster, pandemic, child care assistance doesn't count. And then if uh, child 
tax and earned income tax credit or EITC also doesn't count. So pretty, pretty significant change from the Trump era rule, but again, a return to the way things used to be. Now, as far as the who, most immigrants do not need to worry about this, the new public charge sort of evaluation. And again, this is an evaluation that occurs either upon entry into the United States or upon a, 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 an adjustment, uh, seeking an adjustment of status to lawful permanent resident status. So who is not, um, uh, uh, who does not need to worry about the public charge rule anymore? Most immigrants, so lawful permanent residents, i.e. green card holders, refugees, asylees, special immigrant visa holders, folks who are applicants for or re-registrants for temporary protected status, um, and then a variety of other smaller, um, lesser used um, categories. So this is one of those things where um, one should definitely uh, uh, get a, a copy of this guide, and then also, um, you know, if you have access to uh, some sort of uh, immigrant legal services or expertise, you always want to check your status. But it very, very just dramatically narrows the, the folks who, who would have to worry about this. Um, and again, just as a reminder, the inquiry now again returns to the historical approach of only focusing on the cash-based benefits received by the applicant, not the applicant's family members. So why don't I just pause on that and see if anyone has any questions about the new public charge rule. Thank you, uh, Mr. Press, and I apologize for popping on and up on and off on the screen, uh, but I'm having a little bandwidth uh, issue here today. And so um, I'm gonna turn to Supervisor Otto Lee, see if he has questions on the public charge rule. Very thorough explanation. And um, in my view, certainly good news for uh, our county in terms of our ability to get help to the people who need help. So let me turn to Supervisor Lee, see if he's got comments or questions on uh, this portion of your presentation. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, no, I don't have any. Maybe I'll wait till the public if there's anybody would like to speak on that. All right. Then um, let me see if Mr. Press has additional have remarks, and then we'll go to public comment at the end of his entire presentation. Mr. Yeah. Press, I know we have the uh, the grid and the pages that back up the grid. Um, any other area you wanted to highlight today before we turn to the public for comment? Yes, and this is, I would sort of, um, just like with the, yes, thank you, um, just like with the public charge rule, I, I guess I would sort of caption this as marking progress, that as we, as I sort of opened with the whole regulatory uh, and regulatory revision, amendment, repeal process is exceedingly slow, and I imagine very frustrating for everyone who is looking for change to come about, and I just thought it might be worthwhile to mark the really what I consider to be quite dramatic progress that um, has been made uh, in the first um, year-ish, year and a half-ish of the new federal administration, but also quite frankly to mark the progress that this board and this county has led because a number of the things I'm going to talk about, this board has authorized, um, directed, and led a uh, uh, not only this county, but frankly, this state and this nation on, um, and it's really it's really yielding some results here. So again, we've talked about the public charge rule. Um, I also want to talk about, just as a reminder, I think I've mentioned this before, certainly in the grid, that we also have what was called the sunset rule. This was that really uh, unusual rule that the Trump administration issued at truly the 11th hour um, I think it was the day before <laughs> the uh, final day of the Trump administration. And this would have required this massive reevaluation of all of these different health and human services agency rules. And without that evaluation, they would become, they would expire, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, again, this county with this board's authorization, um, we led the way, we filed, I think not only the first lawsuit, I think the only lawsuit against this sunset rule Based on that lawsuit, 
the filing of that lawsuit, the then very new Biden administration, this is back in early 2021, um, first kicked the effective date out from March 2021 to March of 2022. And then based upon further discussion and analysis, um, agreed to, um, to uh, revisit it from a regulatory perspective and on, um, let me just get the date correct here, on uh, May 27th issued a final rule withdrawing this sunset rule. So regulatory action to undo regulatory action. So that's that's a second one. Um, third is um, on DACA, uh, Supervisor Lee, I know you mentioned this earlier, but uh, just uh, uh, this also happened since our last um, meeting of this task force. Um, on August 24th, um, the federal government issued a, a regulation to, as in their words, to preserve and fortify the DACA program. And that final rule becomes effective October 31st, so just a few weeks from now. And again, this office has played, uh, and this county has played a very prominent role in protecting DACA rights. Um, and then finally, as we discussed at the last task force meeting in August, um, as you know, there are for the Title IX rules, and these were the rules that were, again, substantially uh, revised and changed direction during the Trump administration, that um, now new revised rules are being proposed. They're in the notice and comment phase, and this would, again, frankly, undo a lot of the DeVos rules and return them to more historical practice that I think um, made a lot more sense to a lot of people and we submitted our public comments to those new proposed rules on September 12th. So again, that's a lot of that's a lot of great work and real progress that we can point to that this board can point to um, as far as leading some some really critical efforts um, in in making a difference around the nation on very important questions of public policy. All right, thank you for that. Let me uh, go one more time, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Lee, are you okay if I go to uh, the public or did you wanna? Please, please. Uh, uh, all right, I just wanted to make sure I didn't curtail your questions or comments. Let me check with the clerk, see if we have anyone uh, in the queue to speak on item number five, which is the County Council's report. Would request to speak, Mr. Chair. Let's go ahead and accommodate that request with up to two minutes, please. Blair Beekman, you'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, to quick, first quickly offer, uh, if there is uh, Zoom issues with uh, Supervisor Simidian's uh, Zoom, uh, uh, switching to the phone line is an option that is not always considered, but maybe uh, if it's needed, uh, hopefully it can be of help here. Uh, to continue, uh, I just wanted to uh, offer a thank you for this sort of item and, and your explanations. And uh, it's a lot of relief for myself uh, to hear what you're saying with this item. Uh, thank you. I'm interested in, uh, for all the good uh, things that you're saving and that can re, uh, continue at this time, uh, perhaps in slightly modified form, what are we going to do about uh, the few remaining items that the, there is going to be some changes at the local level uh, within uh, Indian reservations and, and such? Uh, is there a way possibly here today, if not today, something I can look up on my own, but uh, to understand, you know, um, what exactly are, you know, these are small, more marginalized communities that are going to be affected by something and uh, to know more what exactly they're going to be affected by uh, previous Trump administration uh, policies uh, is, is, is needed for myself to understand. And, uh, but an overall a thank you that we, we are able to place back uh, a lot of, of what was the damage from previous uh, administration has done. And uh, a thank you to the work of the county level and uh, uh, what, how you guys are, are trying to help address such issues and uh, uh, the importance of what you guys feel you need to work on always comes through to myself and it's really helpful. Thank you. That concludes public comment, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Press, anything else in the way of wrap up on item number five? No, thank you. 
All right, Supervisor Lee, comments, questions, or simply a motion to receive the report? Yes, motion to receive the report. All right, then I will second that. We'll ask the clerk to call the roll. And uh, before we call the roll, Madam Clerk, let me just say uh, thank you again to Mr. Press and folks in the County Council's office. Uh, I think you've done a very nice job of uh, just sort of detailing how um, on it we have to be in a constant, consistent way uh, to achieve incremental progress. So call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, report is received and motion approved. And uh, let's go next to item number six, which is the report of the Office of the County Executive and relating to federal uh, legislative, regulatory, and administrative uh, matters in advance of the uh, upcoming midterm elections. And I believe we're going to start with uh, Ms. Christian and uh, let her be the uh, uh, air traffic controller who lands us with the right source at the right time for the right issue. Ms. Christian? Yes, uh, good morning. Uh uh, Chairperson Simidian and um, Vice Chairperson Lee. Um, as you mentioned, the midterm election is just around the corner, um, just a little over a month away. And we have our team from Prime Policy Group who's going to provide information on the state of the play related to the House and also to the Senate. And then we'll receive an update on the minority party um, recent announcements and kind of organizing efforts. And then we can touch a little bit on the American Data Privacy and Protection Act that you referenced. Um, if Prime Policy Group has information, it can provide it. I also have a little bit of, a, of an update that I can provide after they give their report. So with that, I'm going to ask Aaron Dorton to uh, take things over and provide a state of the play on the House. All, All right. right. Good morning to the folks from Prime. What should we know? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Lee. Um, so, as you know, um, last week, both the House and the Senate passed the continuing, continuing resolution to extend federal government funding at uh, 2022 levels until December 16th, at which time the expectation is that by then the House and Senate appropriators will have had time to negotiate spending for fiscal year 2023. Um, however, given the landscape, uh, and the very real possibility that Congress will change hands in one or more houses, how that plays out with respect to the appropriations process remains to be seen. To that end, I'll turn to a brief update on state of play regarding control of Congress as we are just under 50, 50 days out from the midterm election. As you're all aware, there are typical trends in a midterm election that seem to be in play here and have been over the past year or so with some ebbing and flowing. The most obvious and well known is that the opposition party has the historical track record of gaining seats, if not the actual majority, in at least one House of, of Congress. That was certainly the assumption heading into the summer. This summer, however, the tide turned uh, slightly in the Democrats' favor as a result of several things. The Supreme Court ruling on the Dobbs case, the January 6th hearings, and the FBI investigation of the former president. However, most of us who have been around politics for a while know that summer is far too early to make a call on an election. Now that we are less than five weeks out from election day, immigration and the economy, issues that are more in the Republican, Republicans' wheelhouse, are capturing most of the headline new, headlines in the news. And people that are, and people, uh, that are not tuned into C-SPAN on and CNN on a daily basis are focused more on those issues than the ones I mentioned before. It is important to note, however, um, abortion is still playing very well with women. So turnout as a result of the overturning of Roe v. Wade could potentially change all predictable turnout models. But recent polling is showing that voters are more concerned about cost of living and the economy versus fundamental, excuse me, fundamental rights and the democratic process. This highlights why we are seeing many Democratic candidates in tough races that are not running on voting rights and the January 6th hearings. To that end, over the past few months, we have seen votes in the House of Representatives on issues that would gain no traction in the Senate, but would aid the frontline Democrats, who are those that hold seats um, that are danger of, in danger of flipping in the House. For example, a vote um, about a week or so, a week or two ago on um, 
police fund uh, police funding. With respect to specific races, this cycle, it has been somewhat more difficult to predict outcomes. For one, Republicans have had some problematic statewide candidates in, in a few places where they should be in a position to pick up a House seat. But the statewide candidates are either too polarizing or extreme or have some personal baggage, both of which could affect down ballot candidates. And two, another factor that makes the House less predictable is that polling is geared towards statewide races. For example, we know that two particular Senate seats in Pennsylvania and Arizona might otherwise uh, be toss ups, but the polling is telling us otherwise. By that token, we would guess that some down ballot House races in those states might be doing better than we actually imagine. All that said, specifically in the House, the numbers are certainly not kind to Democrats. However, uh, what we are seeing right now is that this could be a very, very tight race. Um, the Republicans could have an incredibly close margin, as little as five seats at the end of the day. Many analysts are now thinking that if the election was today, not five weeks from now, the House would be very close and play out district by district with very individual races being run. I'll cite two examples of races that may or may not break the way they are predicted. Um, Representative David's seat, Sharice Davids um, in Kansas, the only Democratic House seat in Kansas, was redrawn to include more rural Republican leaning areas and should be a Republican pickup. She now faces a tough race after several terms in Congress. However, the national debate over uh, abortion could work in her favor, as uh, you'll probably recall in a surprising move this summer by conservative Kansas voters, they rejected a constitutional amendment that would have banned abortion. So this race is now a Democratic toss up. Um, next, a race that could have automatically been in the Democrats column um, in Arizona, Representative O'Halloran's seat was redrawn to include more Republicans. We'll see how this one plays out, given that the Arizona Senate race is leaning Democratic. His, his opponent called on the Arizona legislature to decertify President Biden's win in 2020. Pundits have this one in the leans Republican column as a GOP pickup. Um, so I'll just close by saying that a working theory is that if Democrats can do what they appear to be doing in the Senate and shifting that momentum to potentially keep control there, um, where it seems more likely, we could assume that there's a chance, slim, however, that more races could break in their favor than we expect as of now. However, Republicans are favored to win in the House, and it is expected that the polls will start turning more in their favor in the coming weeks as we inch closer to Election Day. But unless there's a huge jump in those numbers, it's not out of the realm of possibility that it'd be a very tight with a slim chance, a very tight margin with a slim chance of the Democrats keeping the majority. I'll turn now to the program now over to my colleague, Aquila Powell, who will give an update on some Senate races. Thank Thanks, you so Aaron. much, Ms. Powell. Thanks, Aaron. Supervisor Simidian and Lee, it's a pleasure to see you both. As Aaron mentioned, we are five weeks out from the election and it's beginning to look a lot like the election may render a return to divided government. Republicans are ahead, uh, ahead in the race for the House, while Democrats have a slight edge in the Senate, but are facing strong headwinds in trying to keep control of the Senate. Ever since the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision, the national environment has improved for Democrats. However, there are still a few reasons to think some races could swing back to the Republicans uh, in, the, in the final weeks. Yesterday, OPEC announced plans to cut oil exports. That's giving Democrats quite a bit of anxiety as they're, af they're afraid that this could cause gas prices to spike in the coming weeks leading to the election. I'm going to quickly highlight some of the key Senate races that could determine which party wins control. This year, 35 of the 100 U.S. Senate seats are up. 14 seats are held by Democrats and 21 seats are held by Republicans. Six senators are retiring. Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina, Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania, Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama, Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri, all of which are Republicans, and Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, who is a Democrat. In terms of battleground states, um, most political watchers would consider Alaska, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Missouri, Nevada, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin to be this year's battleground states. I'm going to go through a few of those and just talk a little bit about the candidates um, and where things stand today. 
So for Alaska, incumbent Senator Lisa Murkowski, Kelly Shabaka, and Patricia Chesborough are running for a seat in the U.S. Senate from Alaska. Whereas Buzz Kelly advanced the primary, he withdrew on, sep on September 12th and endorsed Shabaka. Murawski and Shabaka have led in media attention and together won more than 80% of the primary vote with Murkowski receiving 45% and Shabaka receiving 38.6. Senator Murkowski, the incumbent, has highlighted her seniority and her, and her willingness to work with Democrats. She's helped steer federal funding to Alaska. Um, she's considered bipartisan to an extent. She has a good relationship with Senator Manchin and some others on the Democratic side. She also voted to convict then President Donald Trump after the US House impeached him. That has made her a target of the former president and several of the MAGA Republicans. US Senator Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and fellow Alaskan Senator Dan Sullivan endorsed Murkowski. She also has the endorsement of several key Democratic elected officials, including Senators Manchin and Senator Sinema. In Arizona, incumbent Mark Kelly, Blake Masters, and Mark Victor are running in the general election for one of Arizona's U.S. Senate seats. Mark Kelly took, took office in December 2020 following a special election. Before joining Congress, he was a U.S. Navy pilot and a NASA astronaut. His wife, former U.S. Uh, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, uh, founded uh, Americans for Responsible Solutions. She was, of course, um, shot several years ago um, and has recovered, but she's become a strong advocate for gun rights. Uh, her, her husband's opponent uh, is Blake Masters. He's a venture capitalist and he became president of the Field Foundation in 2015. Um, he supported several Republican candidates and has the support of former President Donald Trump. Donald Trump endorsed Masters in August Second, um, Mark Kelly is slightly ahead in the polls in that race, but it's Arizona um, and they have a pretty uh, nasty gubernatorial race going on right now um, that could possibly tilt uh, the, the, uh, this election, this particular race for Senate. Um, I listed Florida. I'm not so sure I truly believe Florida is a, a battleground state. Um, incumbent Marco Rubio and Val Demings are vying for that seat. Um, Marco Rubio is ahead of the polls. And it's also not clear how the most recent hurricane is going to affect turnout in Florida. Um, again, I'm not so sure that's truly a battleground. I think um, Marco Rubio is going to prevail in that. Congresswoman Demings. Um, while she is formidable and she is a former sheriff, has a great law enforcement background, she's a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, it is Florida and Marco Rubio is a lot more popular than I think um, some of the Democratic Party want to give him credit for. Um, the next race I want to highlight is Georgia. This is one that's been getting a lot of press this week. Um, it's incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock um, and Herschel Walker. Um, Senator Warnock serves as the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. That's where uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King served as pastor. Um, this is a race that is, is very, very closely watched. Um, earlier this week, um, Herschel Walker isn't having a great week. He's probably gonna need to uh, throw a Hail Mary to win this race. Um, it came out that uh, Herschel Walker had allegedly paid for his then girlfriend to have an abortion. And his son um, has also been very critical of Herschel Walker as a candidate and as a father. So he's receiving some pretty bad press. I think um, Republicans are still rallying around him, but it's possible that um, voters just pass on the Senate race, at which case Warnock wins. Um, the gubernatorial race in Florida is between the current governor, Brian Kemp, and Stacey Abrams, who's a Democratic activist who ran four years ago. Um, it does not look like Abrams is going to pull it out. Um, Kemp is running a pretty disciplined campaign, and he is ahead of the polls. I, I don't think that um, 
Warnock will be able to win on his own without Stacey Abrams. And it looks as if, despite Herschel Walker's issues, that Kemp has pretty strong coattails. But right now, uh, they're tied in the polls. So we'll see how that one, um, how that one shakes out. Um, in Missouri, Trudy Bush Valentine is running against Eric Smith, the Republican. Uh, this is an open seat because Senator Roy Blunt uh, is not seeking re-election. Uh, Bush Valentine is a Democrat and she's the heiress to the Anheuser-Busch Beer Company. Um, this race is one that's also going to be too close to call. Um, Missouri is probably more of a purple state than a true red state. Um, and Eric Smith has definitely had some, some challenges on the campaign trail. Um, Donald Trump won Missouri in 2020 by I think about 15.4% percentage points. And the last time a Democratic candidate won statewide in Missouri was in 2012 when US Senator uh, Claire McCaskill uh, defeated Jer uh, Jay Nixon. So it looks as if that one is also going to be a toss up. Um, Nevada is another one uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, US Senator uh, Catherine Cortez Masto is the incumbent. Um, she is running against former state attorney general Adam Lacks. Um, this is a very, very close race. Um, Cortez Masto is the first ever Latina elected to the US Senate. Um, she has had some challenges in terms of voter support. Uh, President Biden is not that popular in Nevada, but Nevada does have a significant Latino population that will play an important role in the election's outcome. That one also is, uh, is too close to call. Um, and the final one that I wanted to mention was Pennsylvania. This is John Fettering, Fetterman running against Dr. Oz. Um, this one has received a lot of national attention. Um, Fetterman, Fetterman is the current Lieutenant Governor. Um, he looks like he's out of central casting for West Philadelphia. I think he's 6'4", um, lots of tattoos, ball head, goatee. He looks like Pennsylvania. He looks like Philadelphia. Dr. Oz, on the other hand, is very much Hollywood and is being perceived as a carpetbagger. Um, this is Dr. Oz's first run for political office. Um, and it does not look like he's gonna prevail. I mean, all of these races are tightening up, but um, it looks like the Pennsylvania seat is the Democrats' best chance for a pickup in the US Senate. Um, I'm gonna stop there. Those are the main ones that I wanted to cover. Are there any questions? Thank you. Um... <clears throat> Uh, forgive me, I had, took a moment to unmute. Let me go first to uh, Supervisor Lee because I see his hand is raised. Yes, thank you for the uh, very uh, uh, insightful uh, review of many of these races. So let me go to some of the questions I have regarding the Senate race first that you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I absolutely agree with you regarding the potential uh, uh, pickup about the uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, 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 Federman over in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, running against, I guess, in this case, Dr. Oz, who couldn't remember how many houses he has. And as you said, uh, from New Jersey or just from Pennsylvania, right? That was the issue. He has to keep fighting all this time. And, and certainly had, that uh, has not really gone too well. Um, I, I learned the word crudite, though, I mean, from this phrase. So. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. In any case, uh, the other race I thought it was uh, also very insightful. Uh, that was very interesting. It's about Georgia, mm -hmm. where we have uh, Herschel Walker, who couldn't remember how many kids he had for a while, and then now we have uh, this issue about paying for a girlfriend's abortion and the son who has been, you know, uh, I mean, I'm one of the many sons who, who knows how many at this point uh, is now criticizing him. So I think certainly I think it's, it's very interesting to see how these are playing out you know, near the near the uh, election day when all this stuff usually comes out. Um, a couple of races you didn't mention, I was going to ask about this um, Ohio for Tim Ryan's race mm -hmm. uh, and this race in Wisconsin where the Lieutenant Governor um, Della Barnes is running also in Iowa as well, whereas a Vice Admiral, uh, a Navy Vice Admiral is running as well. Um, can you talk about those a little bit, please? Um, sure, I will take uh, Wisconsin and Ohio because I'm more familiar with those. Um, sure. My colleague, me who's from 
have or may be a bit more familiar with that race than I am. Um, let me start with, with Wisconsin. Um, incumbent Senator Ron Johnson is running against Mandela Barnes, as you mentioned. Um, Ron Johnson is close to former President Trump. Um, Mandela Barnes is progressive. Um, he's made some missteps in some of the things that he said. Um, I think this race is going to be hard for Mandela. Um, I, I think that um, whereas Wisconsin in the past has been more progressive, I'm not so sure that Mandela is connecting with independent voters enough to propel him um, to a win. I'm just not really. I'm not, I'm not really seeing that. I think at times Mandela can come across um, a little immature. And you know, if he's standing next to Ron Johnson, and sure, Ron Johnson has definitely said some out of the box crazy things over the years, but Mandela may present a little bit too junior. I mean, I'm not, I just don't see this as being his time. Um, and that is my personal opinion, but in the polls, I believe Ron Johnson is kind of holding his own also. Um, in Ohio, Tim Ryan and J.D. Vance. Um, this race is kind of neck and neck, depending on which day you look at it. Um, J.D. Vance may be slightly up in the polls. I think this one is going to be too close to call. Tim Ryan, um, current U.S. House member, moderate Democrat, um, very much the candidate of the working man, right? He's done a lot around man manufacturing, bringing U.S. jobs back. He's seen, seen as pretty good on um, economic issues. The unions love him. Um, J.D. Vance served in the Marine Corps from 2003 to 2007 before he started working in venture capital in San Francisco. Um, he wrote Hillbilly Elegy. Um, people have their some opinions about that book. Um, so I, I'm not so sure how that one's gonna go. Um, J.D. Vance was endorsed and I believe he recruited by uh, former President um, Trump. And I think Trump is playing pretty big in Pennsylvania. So we'll see how that one goes as well. Um, Rich, can you take Iowa? And before we go to Mr. Mead, I, you said he was playing pretty big in Pennsylvania and I think it was just a slip of the tongue. Yes, uh, Ohio. At Met Ohio, have, yes? Absolutely, sorry about that. No worries, thank you. Mr. Mr. Mead, what, what would you like to share? Sure, the race in Iowa, Senator Grassley has served in the Senate since 1981, and he's uh, in his 80s, and so there is some questions about his age and and things of that nature. However, he's still maintaining a, about a eight to ten point lead over Mike Franken, his opponent. Uh, the Democratic uh, Senatorial Committee has announced that they are not putting any money in Iowa, which tells you that they think that it's, it's probably too steep for the hill to climb to try and defeat Grassley, who remains, even though he's up there in years, he's still uh, very popular in the state. And I would expect he won't win like he has in the past, but I think he'll win with, you know, 55 or 56 percent of the vote. All right. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, I see your hand is still raised, sir. Right. Thank you so much. That was very, very helpful indeed, uh, since there's so many races to keep track of. Uh, but so um, we talked about uh, many of these uh, pick up potential Democratic pickup like Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri, uh, and uh, and then of course there are some that are uh, incumbents of Democrats, which is uh, in this case Arizona and Georgia and Nevada. Those are the the races that the Democrat needs to keep. And given the landscape right now, because of that, I would say it's fair to say that the Democratic keeping the Senate is pretty good at this point. Would you agree? I don't know if I would say it's pretty good. It's possible. I mean, because keep in mind, um, I mean, with OPEC raising gas prices, I mean, yeah, that's going to affect people's outlook. Um, and it's so close to the election. I, I'm, just, I'm just not sure. I mean, I think, um, I think Pennsylvania is a pickup. Democrats might lose Nevada. Um, George is anyone's guess, anyone's guess. I mean, I'm hoping that um, independents and Republicans will just be so embarrassed by Herschel Walker that they'll just skip the Senate race, at which case Warnock 
wins. But again, that's not a pickup. That's just us holding on. That's just us holding on to that seat. Um, Ohio, I'm not sure. Uh, Mandela Barnes is not going to win in Wisconsin. In North Carolina, uh, there's an African American uh, African American female judge running, Sherry Beasley. I don't believe she's going to win there. That's not going to be a pickup for us. Um, Florida, Val Demings, that's not going to be a pickup either. So we would need to pick up probably two seats and, and hold on to all the ones we have now. And I just don't see, I, I, it, that's hard. It would be very hard. It's possible, but I think it would be very hard. I mean, I'm confident Pennsylvania is a pickup. The rest of them, I'm not so sure. No, thank you very much for the very realistic look at it. And uh, I think, like I said, this is a nail biter again this year for the for the Senate. Now, the House, of course, as you know, is far more candidates because after all, uh, the system of our constitution is that the Senate changes only uh, one third of seats, right? Of 100, only 33 or 34 change seats every two years. The House, on the other hand, all 435 is up, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So this one's certainly a harder to, to track, I think, in that sense. Uh, and uh, and uh, with the uh, really exciting result, uh, well, the sad the sad uh, uh, result from the the Supreme Court in this case became a booster, uh, as we could see in the uh, Kansas uh, uh, surprising numbers of close to twenty percent of a red state supporting the woman's right to choose, um, and and how that has of course affected some of the special elections in New York and even Alaska. Right. Even nobody, frankly, would believe that Sarah Palin would be beating Alaska in the statewide race. Um, do you see that? Uh, do you see that uh, uh, this issue will, will continue to to resonate? Uh, 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 to uh, really, it's like get, getting getting the pro choice uh, women and men to and the younger generation to vote. Do you think that that is likely? I, I think the um, it will definitely help with the women's votes, but I. I think ultimately economic issues trump everything. And if the economy is improving, gas prices are down, food prices are down, it helps the it helps the Democrats. If gas prices start going back up, leading to the holiday season when you already have inflation, I think that could be a problem. I mean, for the House to flip, you only need four or five seats, if I remember correctly. That's a very, very slim margin. Um, so in my mind, I, I think it probably is going to slip. And keep in mind, a lot of the congressional districts um, have had significant significant population changes um, as a result of the census. So that also is changing. I mean, redistricting is going to affect that. There have been a lot of retirements. Um, I wish I had better, you know, news for you regarding the House. I just, I, I'm just being realistic. I just don't think the Democrats are going to hold on to it. Well, I think that's what the uh, the general consensus is out there. Um, I, I guess the, the issue regarding inflation is, you know, as we all know, really the the presidency really has very little to control the the, the inflation compared to, let's say, the uh, the Federal Reserve, right? But the general public doesn't see that. Um, so the other thing I want to mention is, as we all know, a lot of the oil prices or natural gas prices, these these inflation of specifically on energy, has a lot to do with the invasion of Ukraine, right? And then we do have quite a few um, Vladimir Putin, uh, uh, I won't say supporter, but at least sympathizers uh, in the Republican Party. Some of the Margot wing seems to have that. Do you see any people tying the two, like those who are supporting or sympathizing with Putin's are, 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 are also are the ones responsible for the war and also the, the energy prices going up? Or that tie has not really been, uh, been uh, understood by a lot of people? if your average voter is making that connection, your average voter. Um, I think last couple of weeks, Ukraine has not been getting as much um, coverage on the nightly news um, as it used to be. Uh, no longer the lead-in story. Um, I think some people are aware of the tie-in, but I don't know if it's as much of a, a concern as it once was when gas prices were really high a few months ago. Gas prices started coming down and they started stabilizing. Now with OPEC's decision yesterday, people are speculating they're gonna come back up. So that might be an issue. Maybe they'll tie it into Ukraine. It's, it's, I think it's hard to tell. 
Thank you. And 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 the issue of the the Putin sympathizers. Do you see that issue being even raised at all um, these days, or do you think it's just back to the domestic issue that people are focusing on? I don't hear a lot about Putin's sympathizers. Um, I think people are more focused on the domestic issues. Um, you know, I, I could be wrong in that. I just, I have not heard a lot about Putin's sympathizers. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, as we know, there's always been uh, the, the Tucker Carlson who somehow really uh, seems to fawn over uh, what what uh, what uh, uh, this uh, what <laughs> this Russian demagogue is doing. Uh, and somehow it gets played very well in Fox News, him being the number one, you know, watched uh, uh, TV opinion show, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, that certainly has a lot of effect of, of how uh, people vote or, or view things. And, and, and so I wonder if that would actually bite that uh, arm, that, that, that area in the back. But anyway, so again, we could talk about this all day. And, and I just want to apologize. Uh, uh, why so meeting. We could, we could talk for hours on this, but I think we certainly have to delve into many of these exciting races. And I certainly personally uh, will be going to uh, visiting Reno to do some work uh, on that election. I get a chance to meet with uh, Senator Warnock a week ago. Uh, very, very uh, impressive and exciting race to, to come. And uh, we certainly have a lot of work to do. And uh, without being partisan, and I will just uh, sign off. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I will um, say thank you to the folks at Prime. And I, I want to just um, first underscore we have a relatively uh, small number of folks today sitting in on the task force meeting, but when we have a conversation like this, I think it's important to underscore that the reason we're having the conversation is because the political outcome of the coming elections has the potential to have significant impacts on the work of the county. So I'll just uh, say that it may be a statement of the obvious, but I think it's um, important to uh, sort of keep that top of mind. The other thing I would say is um, uh, Ms. Dorton Graff and uh, Ms. Powell and Mr. Mead, I, um, I, I, as I listen to all of you and have given some thought to the conversation this morning in advance of the meeting, uh, I, I think we really are in um, uncharted territory. And the honest answer is uh, we'll know the day after the election or maybe the week or two after the election, depending on how long it takes for the votes to come in. The reason I think these uh, conversations are helpful and important, however, is, and here I want to lean in a little and talk to uh, Ms. Christian and Mr. Preminger and uh, Mr. Press from uh, the county, the county executive's office and the county council's office, is I, I think we need to be mindful of uh, the fact that there will be, well, let me strike that. I think we need to be mindful of the fact that there may be um, a, uh, a set of changes in the political landscape that have a real impact on the work of the county. And so we need to be uh, sort of ready uh, the day after the election to say, all right, here's what the new world will look like. Uh, for good or for ill in the view of our county, and how do we adapt to that? And um, uh, again, to you know, Ms. Christian and Mr. Preminger, uh, nice to see you, and Mr. Press, I, I am remembering uh, the uh, Health and Hospital Committee meeting we had, which was then chaired by Supervisor Yeager, uh, and the meeting was, I think, literally the day after the election of uh, President Trump, and uh, the expectation was that with a Republican Congress and uh, uh, President Trump uh, headed to the White House, that uh, the Affordable Care Act would be in a world of hurt. And I remember just saying at the time, it, you know, it just means we have work to do, uh, sort of damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Uh, the work that Mr. Press talked about in terms of uh, the county council's office, um, is uh, uh, all the more relevant and important when we have uh, a challenging political climate in which to do our work. So I, I think uh, my first observation, my first takeaway is I don't really think we know what's coming. I think uh, we're in uncharted territories. And I, you know, my classic on the one hand, on the other hand is on the one hand, 
uh, with the president's approval rating uh, not good, with the folks uh, in the country thinking that the direction of the country is not good, with uh, Republicans holding a slight advantage in the congressional generic ballot, um, I think uh, uh, that some changes would at least historically be expected. That being said, uh, we're in a very unusual time, and I, I think our ability to predict based on traditional indicators is um, uh, uh, unclear. I'll just let it go at that. Having said all of that, I'm going to look to Mr. Mead and Ms. Powell and uh, Ms. Dorton Graff. It, it seems most likely that whatever changes there will be are likely to be relatively modest in terms of the numbers of folks in the Senate, um, potentially modest in the House, uh, things shifting towards Republicans, but then perhaps improving somewhat for Democrats, and, and, and that, um, that, that the most likely prediction I, I would be inclined to make is that things are going to continue to be divided, closely divided, and that's going to make it hard to do work. We know that 60 votes is the magic number in the Senate, as we've discussed with you all previously. We know that when either party holds the House by a narrow margin, their ability to take dramatic action is uh, limited, particularly given the situation in the Senate. Certainly, if we end up with a uh, president of one party and a Senate or House or both of the other. Uh, so I think, um, I just think it what it means, Mr. Preminger and Ms. Uh, Christian and Mr. Press is um, uh, settle in because we're going to have to do, uh, you know, a lot of hard work over the coming years to deal with a set of circumstances that are going to be unsettled pretty much regardless. Um, uh, now, having been patiently listening to that uh, soliloquy, uh, Ms. Powell, Mr. Mead, uh, Ms. Uh, Dorton Graff, any, any observations, including a different take, feel free. That's why we have these conversations. Um, <clears throat> Supervisor Smitty, and I think your, your uh, sort of net, net, net uh, outcome is that we're still going to have a closely divided government is, is pretty spot on. Um, I think it's, I think it's likely the House will flip to Republicans, but how big the majority is, is yet to be seen. And, and, and under any scenario, even under the best case scenario for the Republicans, it's still not going to be an overwhelming majority. It's still going to be fairly narrow. And in the Senate, you know, whether it's 50-50 or 51-49, either way, again, you don't have the 60 votes. So in, in many regards, I've often said that I think oftentimes the minority leader in the Senate sometimes has more leverage and more power to in the Senate because they're the ones who, who can stop things and say what can't get done, even though the majority leader may have an agenda that they want to get done, it's the minority leader that, that blocks things and, and determines what gets through and what doesn't. So they'll be closely divided government, I think is a, is a good outcome. But have you, as you said, um, there, there may, with some of these changes coming from the election, there, there may present some challenges for the county. And you're, as you said, just need to be prepared uh, to deal with them. I was planning uh, to cover a little bit of what the Republicans in the House are outlining for their agenda, should they win the majority, and then talk about some of the health care items on, under the agenda, uh, since Mr. Margolin is out today observing the holiday. So with that, unless there's further questions uh, around what you said, uh, Mr. Smithian, I would proceed with my report. Before uh, we do that, uh, Mr. Mead, let me just um, check to see if Supervisor Lee Hand is, quote, still up or whether uh, it just is up from his prior inquiry. Supervisor Please, Lee? Uh, I, I forgot to ask a couple of questions. I forgot. Please do. And then I'm going to go to Mr. Press. And then Mr. Mead will wrap up item number six before we formally go on uh, to item number seven on the healthcare landscape. Back to you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. So um, we've been hearing a lot of issues with potential indictment relating to the uh, Trump uh, sphere of uh, individuals uh, a few weeks earlier. Uh, 
is a procedural question, and that is, is it possible, is it true that there's no indictment that has to be given between now and the election of the DOJ practice? That's my first question. And the second question is about the J6 hearing. We know they were going to have a hearing uh, the day when, uh, when I guess, was Fiona or Ian, or Ian going to hit Florida, and I know they got postponed. So I just want to uh, find out uh, what you guys hearing in terms of the, the next step on the, the hearing, because obviously, as soon as that hearing is up again, then there will be more uh, idea focused back onto those issues. I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Uh, Press on the first question about the indictment, but on the second question about the January 6th hearing, they were scheduled to have it the day of the hurricane when everyone was still here in town. Since then, the House has adjourned and the Senate adjourned. So I don't know if, whether they convene a hearing, even though most members are not in town or convene one virtually. I've not heard, I don't know if Aquila or Aaron, if you've heard any specific plans from the January 6th uh, committee. I think I heard October 13th, but I need to double check that. But that seems to ring a bell. Um, the other thing I would mention about January 6th, if the House flips and the Republicans take over, I don't know how much more we're going to hear about this investigation. Even if the Democrats hold on to the Senate, Senate rules require both parties to issue subpoenas. And so if it's just the Democrats, I don't know how far January 6th would go in the Senate, because you'd have to have both parties support, both the minor majority and minority, that is. All right. Uh, so Ms. Powell, thank you for uh, that. And I'll ask you to, uh, once you have clarity on the date uh, and schedule, if there is clarity on the date and schedule, if you could just share that with our team off agenda, that would be much appreciated. Absolutely. And thank you. And Supervisor Lee, uh, let me turn to Mr. Press, if I may, to uh, address uh, your other question, as uh, Mr. Mead suggested. And then I believe Mr. Press wanted in uh, to share a thought or two uh, on other topics that we have raised. Mr. Press, to you. Yeah, sure. First, I'm sorry, Supervisor, I had a little trouble hearing. Could you repeat your question about the indictment issue? Sure. Uh, I believe the Department of Justice has some type of a um, practice that there is a bit of a period of time before the election that they do not want to issue indictments. Uh, in order to not affect a upcoming election. Uh, and because of that, I believe a whole bunch of indictment was filed uh, uh, with, I think, like 30 individuals that was close to former President Trump. Uh, so that being the case, as we know that, you know, indictment or, or, or criminal charges of the DOJ a lot of times is going to uh, potentially affect uh, the uh, outcome of elections, or at least a view of some of the viewers. Uh, I'm just trying to find out from you if you know of any um, type of a ruling on it, because obviously the court case regarding the um, Mar-a-Lago search is still very much well and alive. Uh, there's appeals going back and forth between the district court judge and the court of appeals and the special master. And you see those news every two, three days in the news, right? So um, I just want to see if uh, in terms of the uh, news cycle, uh, is it something that the Department of Justice could not do? Uh, because of the policy they have, or, or just business as usual, that there might potentially be more and more of these bombs being dropped between now and election day from the Sure. Team. So, yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, um, so just to, to, to be clear, um, federal criminal law is a little far afield from my area of expertise. So I'm kind of following along with the rest of you uh, in terms of what I'm reading in the media. Um, I'm not, I haven't read the actual text of their policy, but I would presume that if it's a policy, um, then they are free to um, uh, apply it as they see, as they see fit. Um, I'm not sure what sort of exceptions they have allowed themselves historically or otherwise. Um, but yeah, I, I would say as someone who maybe has a little bit more of a, uh, federal criminal background might might uh, be able to speak to it more authoritatively. All right, Mr. Press, why don't we just ask uh, if we could get an off agenda report from uh, County Council's office on uh, the implications of the question that Supervisor Lee uh, offered. Um, you know, I don't think uh, 
the supervisor is asking for a full briefing on the matter, just a, sort of a rough uh, assessment, analysis, understanding of um, what the process does or doesn't look like. Supervisor, sure. does that work for you? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And then, Mr. Press, briefly, anything else? And I say briefly only because I am now told we have a hard stop at 1.30. Forgive me. I should have mentioned that at the outset. Excuse me, 11.30, our time. Uh, I should have mentioned that at the outset. Back to you, Mr. Press. Sure. Just very quickly to your comment about, you know, this. we're going to be at this for a while. Um, certainly, um, as you've seen in a lot of our legal uh, actions, while it's certainly um, very possible to secure what we call provisional relief early on in a case. Um, as you can see from the the chart that we provide um, to this to this task force, many of these cases, regardless of what side we may be on, whether we're parties or just uh, providing amicus support, these go up and down the courts of appeal, the Supreme Court on occasion. Um, and so we measure our work in a matter in matters of years, um, not days, not weeks, not months. Uh, so we are we are in for the long haul, absolutely. Yeah, thank thank you. I think we are in for the long haul may become our bumper sticker. Uh, and um, Mr. Mead, before I uh, go back to you, let me just ask: Is there a brief? Uh, uh, update on the privacy matters that I raised, Ms. Christian, uh, earlier in the meeting. And uh, again, I'm not looking for a full-blown report here. We can uh, take that up at the next meeting of the task force. But if there's a brief update, I'd certainly appreciate hearing it. Uh, Chairperson Smitty, and I can share with you that the American Data Privacy and Protection Act was passed by the House Energy and Commerce Committee in July, probably telling you information that you know better than I, um, by a vote of 53 to two to advance it. Um, it would establish a national standard on what data companies can gather on individuals and how they can use it. Uh, some of the provisions to gain some bipartisan support um, allowed for the, the federal law to override state privacy laws, which in California, you'll recall we have a, a pretty robust um, set of standards and, and regulations and statute, which were the result of some negotiations. A few years ago, there had been a ballot measure that was going to go to the voters, and the legislature was able to come together and come up with an agreement that that took that off the ballot. So, so that's one concern that I think some some individuals have expressed as reasons for not supporting or endorsing the bill. Prime Policy Group could talk a little bit more about this, but I understand it has a little bit of a long road ahead of it as there are some key Democrats in the Senate who are opposed to the measure. Specifically, the chair of the Senate Commerce Committee publicly stated her opposition to the draft of the bill that was released in June. And in, in quick search, it appears that even after the House um, Energy and Commerce Committee action, she still remains opposed to the bill. I don't have specifics on her concerns, but we can definitely research that and come back to your next meeting and provide a, a more robust and thorough report for you. All right. Let me see if Prime has anything they'd like to add uh, and uh, just to round out the picture, and then I will make a specific request for information. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Supervisor Smitty. I will make this a very condensed version of my report, and again, I can follow up with you with any uh, questions you may have, but the the House Republicans, uh, as they did in 1994, outlined their agenda should they take the majority. But unlike in 1994, where they had 10 specific bills, they said they'd pass in the first 100 days, they've rather this time just put forward four broad planks, uh, an economy that's strong, nation that's safe, a future that's built on freedom, and a government that's accountable. And under each of those sort of planks, there are some more specifics, but not a lot of specific legislative, you know, texts or legislative proposals. Let me just call out a couple of things that might be of interest to the county. Under a nation that's safe, they're talking about adding an additional 200,000 police officers uh, nationwide, and they could run that through the COPS program. And that's an area that could uh, have some um, um, bipartisan support. And under a future that's built on freedom, they're talking about uh, having more uh, transparency in our healthcare 
system and also using more telemedicine. And again, that's an area that could uh, have bipartisan support. Most of the rest of the provisions they have are, are very partisan and controversial. And again, as we talked about earlier, even with the Republican House and even if the Republicans have a slim majority in the Senate, they still uh, aren't going to be able to move much of this agenda through, um, you know, through a, 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 a closely divided Senate. And in particular, one of the planks they put was they want to control um, inflation by lowering government spending. Well, again, they're not going to lower spending below what the president wants because he won't sign the appropriations bills that don't have sufficient funding in them. So, like we said, probably more status quo, uh, even with a, a slight change in the composition of the government. Let me just jump ahead to the lame duck and the health agenda because it's a fairly robust agenda. And again, I'm going to give an abbreviated version and can drill down and follow up on these matters. But Mr. Mead, I apologize for the interruption, but I'm going to ask you to hold off on health just because it is a standalone item number seven on our agenda. So if you can just okay. hold that thought for a moment. Let me first uh, check with the clerk to see if we have anybody in the queue to speak on our current item, item number six. We do have one request to speak. All right. Uh, let's hear from that speaker, and then I'll ask for a motion from Supervisor Lee to receive the report. Go right ahead, uh, uh, Madam Clerk. Blair Beekman, you'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman. Thank you very much for noticing my hand, and uh, I will try to limit my public comment to one minute. Uh, as you spoke about American Privacy uh, Act issues, uh, I wanted to make clear that with the uh, recent abortion issues um, that we've been having, uh, a whole new series of what can be data collection practices and civil protection practices for everyday community has been starting to be asked about. And I just wanted to kind of clue yourselves in on that concept. I'm sure you're aware of it. It's important that uh, we, we can really start to address uh, private corporations uh, and law enforcement and the bundling of data collection at this time. I think those questions need to be asked. I think we're at a time to really question uh, civil protections of everyday people again. And what can be the steps to better strengthen those concepts? Uh, it doesn't have to be a fearful subject. Uh, Berkeley has recently, after the past year of their community being upset with them, has made some really interesting changes. So I invite yourselves to look at what Berkeley's uh, steps they've done. We can take our steps, certain steps ourselves at this time, which is just needed. And that's the process of growth and learning and to address uh, data collection that uh, can be a bit out of control from this state. We've allowed it to grow a bit strong in this state when we had good protections otherwise. I also wanted to quickly offer that, uh, thank you for, this will take two minutes, sorry, but uh, in the objective uh, concepts that uh, Supervisor Simidian offered and how to talk about uh, the items on this uh, item, uh, you know, Trump uh, has possibly done some things illegal and we have to hold that accountable and I hope that can be a process in how uh, people are elected, say, in Wisconsin as senators. Uh, good luck on this issue. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, all right, Supervisor Lee, can I get a motion to approve item six, which is simply to receive the report? So moved. Thank you. And I'll second. And uh, before we call the roll, I'll just indicate that I'll have my office reached out to Ms. Christian and through her, uh, the folks at Prime to uh, follow up on the uh, privacy legislation that we've discussed in passing today. Call the roll, please. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thanks very much. And now, Mr. Mead, we are at item number seven, which is a report uh, regarding the federal health policy uh, and budget landscape. Go to it, sir. Thank you very much, Supervisor Smith. Um, let me, like I said, give sort of a, a, a very brief update on these items. And again, I can follow up with your offices uh, with more details if you'd like. But there are, there are several big, well, let me just start by saying the uh, lame duck session of Congress will open up on November 14th, and the Senate will begin its consideration of the National Defense Authorization Act first. And that's going to be the first big 
item, but there are a number of health care items that are going to follow behind it. The first being that the Senate Finance Committee negotiated a bipartisan mental health reform uh, package that whether that's the engine that drives the other provisions or is just one of the items bundled in with an omnibus appropriation act, um, it's it's not clear. But this uh, the, the discussion draft release uh, from the Senate Finance Committee um, is trying to increase access to mental health services, improve mental health workforce shortages, and improve mental health uh, uh, services coverage under the Medicare program. So some very significant policies within that package that are very encouraging from my standpoint that could be moving forward. There's also a bill that passed the House and there's a lot of interest in the Senate that would change the Medicare Advantage plans to ease up their prior authorization for procedures. And that bill has a lot of support and there's a lot of a pretty good likelihood that that will move forward. The only challenge with that is it's scored at a high cost of $16 billion because CBO thinks it'll be the relaxing the prior authorizations will increase access to services. Um, in one of the pandemic response bills, we increased the match on the Medicaid program for our territories. And that uh, increased match is set to expire on December 16th when the continuing resolution is set to expire. And I suspect that that Congress will likely extend that enhanced map uh, in the Medicaid program for our territories. There are also a number of Medicare extenders for ambulance companies as one example. And there's also some um, Medicare cuts that Congress put off last year, like two labs. And I think there's gonna be a package to take care of these so-called Medicare extenders and to prevent these cuts from Medicare from taking place. And then the final big ticket item is um, Congress has to turn off the budget sequestration triggered by the American Rescue Plan under the pay-as-you-go statute. These cuts were set to go into effect at the end of last year, and they delayed them by a year, so they're set to go into effect at the end of this year. And those cuts would mean a 4% reduction in Medicare payments across the board to all providers, and it will also affect a number of other mandatory spending programs like the Commodities uh, Credit Corporation and the Trade Assistance Program. So Congress is likely to act to turn um, those uh, uh, spending cuts off or at least delay them by another year or two as well. So let me pause there because I know we're limited on time to see if there's any questions about the health or the other uh, agenda items in the lame duck session. None from me except to note, and I'll ask my office staff to follow up with uh, you at Prime uh, and with Mr. Margolin, uh, who can't be with us today, but um, I, I do have uh, continuing interest in the Medicare Advantage conversation and the um, range of controversies around that particular program. So uh, to be continued there. Supervisor Lee, anything uh, on uh, the healthcare front before we uh, wrap this up? Thank you. Um, there was some uh, discussion, I guess, regarding the uh, Affirmative uh, Affordable Care Act uh, being uh, potentially challenged in the issue of uh, preventive coverage requirement in the case of uh, Great Wood versus Becerra. Um, and uh, I just want to, to check in with you to see if really is there any issue here where ACA is really on trial again, or is this just something that... Uh, uh, we just left over from the last administration that that shouldn't be an issue we have to worry about. There shouldn't be any issues you have to worry about. Um, the Republicans I've talked to on Capitol Hill have told me, you know, there's no less than the second kick of, of a mule. So they're not going to try and go after the Affordable Care Act. It should they take control of one or, or both bodies of, of Congress. They're, they're not they're just not going to go there. Very good, and especially, of course, uh, the presidency was to have two more years and with President Biden, so it's not like there will be a executive office supporting it either. So, um, so even though the uh, worst case scenario, even both the House and Senate goes to Republican hands, let's say, uh, which I don't foresee, but uh, uh, the worst case scenario is that that uh, uh, having the presidency in, in the Democratic hands, I think a lot of that backstop will still remain, correct? That's right. That's exactly right. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, Chair. All right. Then let me check with the clerk, see if we have anyone in the queue to speak on item number seven. One request to speak. All right. Let's go ahead and hear that speaker. Two minutes, please. 
Blair Beekman, you'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the two minutes. Hopefully I can make this under one minute. Uh, I just wanted to clarify my previous words that uh, what Trump may have been doing uh, with the January 6 incidents was not necessarily illegal, but very, very much needs to be reviewed and questioned. And the people who are, who are around that and who are part of that January 6 process need to be held accountable. And that includes the senator from uh, Wisconsin, Ron Johnson. Uh, it's that process. I think we asked Trump to leave the stage of political uh, concepts and uh, just make the world safer, basically, for the rest of us. And, and that goes with the, along with the people who are around him at the time. Those are my personal feelings that we have to hold the situation accountable. Uh, good luck in the ways how we learn how to do that. Thank you. That All right. Thank you. Request to speak. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Supervisor Lee, can I get a motion to receive the report on item number seven? So moved. I will uh, second and uh, we'll say thank you to all before we call the roll. We will wrap up with this uh, until our next meeting, which is currently scheduled for December the 7th, uh, but with some follow up as indicated on uh, legal matters that uh, Supervisor Lee requested from County Council and follow up that I've indicated I want to pursue on uh, privacy issues and Medicare Advantage issues. Please call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Zimidian. Aye. Thank Motion you. carries unanimously. The report is received. Thank you all. And uh, we'll talk again, uh, I'm sure before, but certainly after uh, Election Day when uh, we'll have a very different landscape uh, to consider. Thank you once again for your participation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Recording stopped.